you already got, got the early message. Hoo -ah. Well, I want to thank Larry for introducing me. Um, I'm a graduate of the Cabin Experience. <laughs> I thought I was pretty squared away until I went to the cabin. Uh, so I thank you, Larry, for the kind introduction. Thank you to Parker for inviting me to be a keynote speaker and share some of my lessons on leadership that I hope that you will be able to take back with you in your practices or wherever you work or reside, your community. Um, I just really appreciate that. And thank you to the foundation, because I'm not here today without the foundation. The foundation sponsors me to speak. And so I really appreciate that. And how awesome to follow some great leaders on this stage. Kent Greenwald, Gary Cuneo, Charlie Dubois. Now, when Gary came off stage, I said, Gary, you were, you were on stage. You got the mic. I can't believe you didn't put the flyer in your hand and say, every single one of you need to sign up for the foundation before you leave. And he looked at me. I'm always policing up the battlefield after Gary. <laughs> uh, you got to love it. But anyhow, he forgot to say that, so I'm saying it for him. I'm, uh, and congratulations, Gary, for a well-deserved and awesome award and for your service. And can I have my turn it up slide? Thank you very much. So I was sitting in New York with a couple of my really good friends in the chiropractic community. We were having lunch at a little dive diner. It was really great. And a doctor that I really, really revere, Jim Powell, man of wisdom, he shared this with me. A candle loses nothing by lighting another candle. And we were talking about service. We were talking about making a difference. We were talking about how do, we, how do we ignite that fire in people's gut to continue to have the passion that they had when they started their profession long into their profession. How do we light that back up? And so I do hope that today in the next couple of minutes that maybe I will be able in some small way to ignite that fire again in your gut, that we'll see it in your eyes, and then it will reflect in somebody else's you share with somebody else, because that's a powerful statement when you figure that sharing with others doesn't take away from your flame. Why would we not share? Wasn't it neat yesterday when we saw two businessmen up on the stage who decided that instead of competing with each other, they would come together, center of gravity, and work for the profession? Is that not awesome? Now, in the military, we call that a coalition force, right? When we can't do it all on our own, we get other people who are interested, and we bring the team together, and we create a center of gravity. And I've loved that about the foundation who's out there and they have tried very hard and very successfully to bring people together to all be part of this profession, to promote it and lift it up, to make a difference. So I'm not a doctor. I'm a doctor wannabe. Although when I go to visit some of the schools, some of the students say, you're not too old to go back to school and become a doctor. And then I'll give them what my GPA was and a few other things and they go, you might want to stick to being the patient, <laughs> right? I love the chiropractic profession because it made a difference in my life. And so as I go through some of my, some of my very few slides and some of my stories about leadership, what I want to do is I want to bring it right back to you, back to, what, to you and your leadership and in your practice. So that when people leave here and leave this conference with all the combined speakers and all the different things that you've learned, that you will go back wherever it is that you live, wherever it is you work, and get people fired up, as we say in the military. Get people fired up. And, 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 you know, what's so interesting to me is that people forget a few things. And number one is that leadership is a choice. And the first person you must lead is you. And everybody really is a leader. Because if you have to at least lead yourself, that makes you, qualifies you as a leader. But most of the time when I speak on leadership, I hear people talk about, oh, I wish, I hope my husband hears that. I hope my kids hear that. I hope my boss hears that. I want you to hear it. Because I believe it's actually one of your... One of your great chiropractors that said, a better me is a better we. I know I heard that from Dr. Carol Ann Melizia, who also, by the way, I wouldn't be here with the foundation if it wasn't for Carol Ann. For Carol Ann, who had a heart of service, fire in her gut, found me and went, you need to see a chiropractor. But we'll talk a little more about that in a minute. How many of you are leading yourself first, leading by example in your practice? Every single one of us, every single day, can learn something new. It's a brand new year, 2015. Maybe just take some small steps, some small measures, things that you can do so that by the end of the year, the cumulative would be that there's a better you in the room. That's called leading yourself. 
But that takes, a, that takes a great deal of attitude. I don't know about the rest of you, but when I'm around, around someone whose face does not say yes, I'm very uncomfortable. And one of the things I love about your profession, and I always tell people this, is that when all the times I went to see military doctors, I never saw a military doctor whose face said yes. Usually their face said, so what are you trying to get out of Halstead? Right? You know, presuming that you're there because you're trying to get out of some sort of training or, or, training or whatever, when in reality you're just trying to get there because you don't feel well. Attitude is something that only we get to control. We get out of bed in the morning, put both feet on the ground, and we control our attitude. You heard that yesterday from one of the speakers. And as you control that, then you use your mind to do great things. But when you control your attitude and you have a positive attitude and you reach out to people and you care about people, you create hope. And that's what leaders do. They create hope. Now, although I, my, a lot of my service was in the military, 27 years in the military and tours in Iraq and Afghanistan, you might say, well, I can't really relate to that because you were on the battlefield. Trust me, every single one of you are on a battlefield every day. Lack of integrity in your practice is a battlefield. So we're not going to talk about the negative, but what I'm going to tell you is that on that battlefield, you are the one that creates hope. Larry talks about it all the time. Uh, and the speaker yesterday talked about how we frame things. Are we framing them positively or are we framing them negatively? Are we giving off positive energy or not? I was known as the, the, the energizer bunny in the military. It's like, do you ever get tired, ma'am? Do you ever sleep? No, not much. You know, Because I love people. I have great passion for helping people, serving people. Wanting to see people find a better version of themselves. Not unlike what most of you do that I've met. So the attitude, you have to create hope. Now that picture I just showed you was in Iraq. Those were all, uh, there was a bus full of wounded soldiers. We had, um, Toby Keith came to sing a concert. And on the base that I lived in, in Balad, there were 8,000 uh, um, 8, people that would fit in the, uh, the stadium to listen to his conference. But we had about 30,000 people that lived on that base. And everybody came to their feet when our wounded warriors stepped off the bus and were put in the front. They didn't come to their feet for Toby Keith. They didn't come to their feet for Becky Hall said they came to their feet for wounded soldiers. Later in this, in this hour, I'm going to be introducing a wounded soldier, a hero. In the, in the army, you're taught that the leadership is about the lead. It's not about the general, it's about the soldier. Take that to heart because it's not about the doctor, it's about the patient. It's not about the doctor, it's about the patient. If more people had that attitude of, it's not about the teacher, it's about the student, what a great and better place that we could live. And I did ask Toby Keith, I said, Toby, when we're done with the concert, would you go down to the front row and shake hands with all the wounded soldiers? By the way, I, it was real painful introducing Toby Keith. You know, looked up at him, he's very tall. Everybody's tall from the real. Anyhow, so, I said, would you go down there and do that for them? And he says, no, I really would not, I would prefer not to. And at first my heart sank like, well, hello, you know. He says, what I'd rather do is I'd rather get on the bus with the wounded soldiers, go back to the hospital so I can spend time with them one-on-one. -on -one. In my mind, Toby Keith's a hero. He went, over, he went over there many, many times to see our soldiers and do that sort of thing, and sure as heck he did. When I came back on stage, his manager, and sometimes managers can get in the way a little bit, but his manager, I said, I'm going to go out and ask him to do an encore. His manager said, no, he's not doing an encore. He never does an encore. I said, well, I'm going to ask him anyhow, right? So I go out and I said, Toby Keith, will you do an encore for these 8,000 airmen, Marines, and soldiers? And he put his arm around me and he says, babe, sure thing. Now, of course, they all liked the fact that the general was called babe. So did I, okay? <laughs> all right. Just can't let that go to your head. Can't let that go to your head because leadership is about others, not about self. You know, but sometimes we get in the way, don't we? We start looking at our practice. We start looking at our business card. We start looking at the car we drive. How many clients came in this week? How many patients did I have, right? We start looking at all that, looking at the numbers. And we forget that the numbers have faces, right? Put faces on your data. It's great that we're all kinds of technology to learn how to keep track of your data, but put faces on your data always, always, always. But sometimes when we're in charge and we get promoted and we get more successful, we get in the way of ourselves. We lose our, our, our humbleness. We lose our authenticity. I was brought to my knees in Iraq for something that I felt that I had failed to do. 
I got a phone call in the middle of the night from a chaplain from the hospital. Said, ma'am, we just had some wounded soldiers brought in. One of our soldiers is in a coma. We need to get him back to Germany as soon as possible. We're not even sure he'll make the trip. His name is Corporal Sandoval. He's on that picture that was just up. Corporal Sandoval, IED. If you know the story of Bob Woodruff, blew out a part of his, uh, part of his head and his brain, lodged uh, BBs in there. And she said, ma'am, he's not going to probably make it. He might not even make the flight, but we're going to get him out of here in the first C-17 that we can. You got to feel real good about that, too, by the way, about how we can get our wounded off the battlefield. 96.7%. And it's great that we can get him off the battlefield. Now when we get him off the battlefield, we need to give him the right care here. We got him the right care here, and you're part of that equation. So anyhow, as the story goes, she called me. I said, should I come over to the chaplain? First mistake. Why would a leader... That'd be like you, the doctor, saying to your, to your uh, assistant, should I, and putting that responsibility on your assistant, you shouldn't do that. But I did. Mistake number one. But of course, my chaplain, she's like, she's, she, ma'am, you get very little sleep. It's 1 o'clock in the morning. Get some shut-eye. We got it under control. We'll let you know how it's going. I'll call you back throughout the night. 4 o'clock in the morning, I, I call her over at the hospital asking how he's doing. He's getting ready to be put on a C-17. But when I woke up and I, and I got my boots on and I started putting myself together, I was like, you know, I shouldn't have done that. And I was very unforgiving of myself. And so I tracked him. I tracked him all the way back. He went back to, to Germany and he survived. And he went back to uh, Walter Reed and then he went to California. And can you pop the picture back up there? Do you see the young man in uniform? That's a young captain. So I'm a general, colonel, lieutenant colonel, major captain, so just a few levels below me. Do you know that when that captain was on his R&R &R leave. Do you know where the first place that he went on his vacation? To California to see his soldier, to see his patient. That's, that's when sometimes we need to remind ourselves that we can lead up. That's when our example, sometimes we might not even know that's what we're doing, but those of you who think you can't learn from those leaders that are younger than you or just started to practice, you can. You can. And we should. We should learn. We should have good collaboration and collegial dialogue. But when I looked at that and I saw him and I saw what he did, he taught me a very valuable lesson because in my mind, he had been more of a leader than I was in this particular equation. And it taught me to pay more attention. It taught me to pay more attention to my young leaders. And when I have time, take the time and be present. There's no way with 20,000 soldiers and over 7,000 wounded in, in, in my ranks that there would be any possibility that I could see all of them. But when I could see them, I should see them. That's the point. And you got to be committed to that and put others before yourself. And in order to do that, you have to hold yourself accountable. And you need to remain authentic. Now, for me, my accountability is maybe different than yours, although as I went to the cabin, I discovered not that much different. I didn't know that every day when I looked in the mirror and I held my dog tags in my hand and I recited the warrior ethos, that I was doing an affirmation. Pretty cool. No music. And I would look in the mirror and I'd look myself straight in the eye and I'd grab my dog tags. And I would recite the warrior ethos. I'll always place the mission first. I'll never accept defeat. I'll never quit. I'll never leave a fallen comrade. And that may sound very military to you, but you can change those words and discover yourself in it. Because everybody in this room has a mission and a purpose. And your comrades are your patients or your fellow peers, your fellow doctors. But here's the key thing about all of that is are you looking yourself in the eye? See, because if you can't look yourself in the eye in the mirror, you certainly can't look your patient in the eye. Or maybe someone else who needs uh, some of your mentoring and coaching. Or maybe someone who needs your correction, whatever it is. So it starts with leading yourself and looking yourself straight in the eye. And I would do that, and I had those, those dog tags in my hand, and then I, on my dog tags was my shield of faith. Because for me, my faith was my foundation. It was very, very important to me. And on my shield of faith is Joshua 1.9. Be strong, be courageous. Don't be terrified. Don't be discouraged for God's with you wherever you go. That was important to me. You all figure out what was, 
what is important to you. And as you've heard so many others say, frame it positively. And then I'd look in the mirror and I'd just say, I don't know if it's the last day, I don't know if it's the first day, but I know this. I know that I need to go out and be the best person I can be, the best leader I can be, the best soldier that I can be. When people ask me, what did you do in the army? I don't tell them I was a general. I tell them I was a soldier. I tell them I was a soldier because soldiering and leading to me is a matter of the heart. It's what's on the inside that counts. It is character and competence. It is not title. It is not status. It is not how much you make. It is not male or female, short or tall. It's what's on the inside. And if you keep paying attention to what's on the inside, as that exudes from you, people are going to know if you are authentic or not. You can't fake that. You can try. But you can't fake it. Be authentic. Stay real. Stay real. It's important to have what I call the power of presence. I wasn't present when I needed to be for Corporal Sandoval. So I made a corrective action. I made sure that when I could be present, I would be. How many of you have ever had a situation where you did all the right things but had the wrong result? That's the picture of little Omar that you see in front of you. Our, our Marines did all the right things at a checkpoint, but it had the wrong result. His mother killed, his aunt killed, his brother killed, he lived. That's his father in the picture. The Marines did all the right things, had the wrong results. So, so number one, you got to go out and you got to embrace people sometimes when they do all the right things and have the wrong results so that you can lift them back up, get them back out there in the fight. You know, in the fight, we don't have time to sit around and, you know, we, we got to get right back out there. But we've got to know, we've got to be encouraged. And then how do you deal with the results of that wrong result? So I would go every Sunday that I could over to the hospital until... He, he was in our hospital for about three months, three to four months. And I'd go and I'd sit with his father and I'd sit with him. We taught him how to salute. He was just the most adorable kid. It didn't make the situation right, but it made the situation more healing because we sat there and we were just present with his father, who was very grateful to us for that. So leadership was about the inside, and it's about character, and it's about making a difference. And this whole conference is about turning it up, turning up the volume, turning up the flame so that you can go out and make a difference. And to me, it's kind of like this. There are so many people in the, in, in the world that are very, very successful, and they do nothing with it. They selfishly keep it for themselves. They make a lot of money. They don't donate it. They do whatever. They're selfish. And yet when I was thinking about my definition of leadership and I went, uh, you know, effectively accomplish the mission is the fourth piece of my, of my definition of leadership. I put effectively, by the way, not efficiently. Because efficiently is all about numbers and data and whatever. When you say you want to effectively get something done, you bring in the human dimension, you bring that face back in. And I was sitting with a, with a friend and I said, well, you know, in reality, you know, if you successfully accomplish the mission, isn't that success? It is. It is success. And too many people stop right there. And what I would urge you today is to go, am I successful or am I significant? And so I added a fifth part of my definition in the very last line, and to make a difference. In other words, I don't want to just be successful. Matter of fact, I'm not, even, I'm not even looking at money or whatever, or titles or whatever. It is more about, is somebody's life better today because I was in it? Is when I go home tonight and I lay my head on a pillow, whatever hotel that might be, right? can I put my head on my pillow and say, today somebody's life is better because I was in it, I have no regrets? Or do I lay my head on my pillow and I can't think of anybody that I even influenced or touched? and make a difference, that's when you go from successful to significant. And I hope that all of you, that that is what you would want to do. Look, this community of chiropractors made a difference in my life. I would not be here today and the quality of health that I enjoy if it wasn't for Dr. Carol Ann Melizia running me down at West Point, putting her little finger in my chest and telling me that I did not have to live in chronic pain, that chiropractic could help me. And I'm like, who are you and what are you doing? I got to go back to Iraq. 
couple of years later, I met back up with her, decided to retire from the military because I was very, very ill with fibromyalgia. And we started this journey of wellness, physical, mental, spiritual wellness. And it was a bit ugly at first. Several years into this now, that was in 2008. And it's looking better. So I'd like to show this picture. The one in uniforms when I met Dr. Carol Ann. The one that was 2011, now we could take another picture, I guess, in 2015. There's a bit of a transformation there. And, and you, can't, you can't give makeup or anything else credit because I still don't wear makeup, and you can criticize me later on that one, okay? Do you not see the difference? Because when we're well on the inside, it exudes on the outside. There's so many things I did not know about fibromyalgia. I didn't know that it was feeding the disease. I've learned so much about nutrition and purification, the whole nine yards. So much about the adjustment. I put it in my terms. I tell everybody, when you sit down at the computer and you see the little hourglass going, blah, and it's not connecting and things aren't working, I go, to me, that's just like, you know, not getting an adjustment. I don't get an adjustment. My spinal cord's not working. And my, right here, you can look in like the little TV and go, none of the right messages are going to the, wherever they need to go, you know? And when that's not happening, you're not in a very good attitude, are you? Right? Hurt. Everything's all messed up. You educated me. Educated me. Made a difference in my life through this journey. Went from 15 prescription drugs in the military to zero today. Zero, 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 zero. So as most of you know, I've been a speaker for the foundation for the last several years. As I started, as I started that journey and things were already clicking really well, Dr. Carol Ann says, I'd like for you to meet Ken Greenwald. And, and you know, talk about strategic leader. He chooses to meet me at the hotel there at West Point, New York. Like, get me on my own playing ground, right? Like, how am I going to say no in the hotel there, historic ground? So he asked me if I would be a spokesperson for the, for the military. I'd only been retired about a year. I learned for 31 years in the Army that you never volunteer. Then the first time I get asked to volunteer, I do it. <laughs> so I said, sure, I'd like to, because here's why. Go back to that first slide and think about the flame, the sharing. When you have something really great and it affects you and, you, you know, and it's making a difference in your life, don't you want to share that? You should. So I said, yeah, why not? I'd like to share that. And then not only can I share that, I can share about the military. And then that has grown into an incredible relationship of how can we help our military better, th you, this community specifically. Now, in the military, people, people now ask me, what do I consider my number one most important accomplishment in the military? And I tell them, leaving a legacy. I don't say being the first woman to do this or that. I say leaving a legacy. This is not making general. Shoot, I didn't even think I was going to make lieutenant. So, you know, making general is still kind of curious to me. But leaving a legacy that I could help develop leaders that after I go, they take over, and after I go, they take over. I did not want to develop followers. I wanted to develop leaders. I've done a couple of college graduations for you all, and i got to tell you, I love it when... I'm up there on the stage, and you go to give a, a, a certificate to the new doc, and there's a whole little entourage, you know, and it's aunt and uncle and mother and father, and those are all chiropractors who influence that new doctor of chiropractic. That's called a legacy, folks. I love it when I meet a young lady in Dr. Carol Ann Malizia's clinic who is so excited she's beyond herself. She writes me a letter, and she goes, I'm going to chiropractic college. Because since she was this high, she was getting adjustments from Carol Ann. Now, here's a question for you. How many of you, if I gave you three minutes, and I'm not going to give you three minutes because we don't have three minutes, but if I gave it to you, how many of you could start listing all the names of the people that you consider part of your legacy that have gone off to do chiropractic? See, because you need it. You need it. I'm a patient. We need it. We need more of you. You cannot keep the same number of students in a college when the population is growing and the greater population is growing even more that needs you. So one of the things I think is really neat is there's a bit of a critical mass among you between um, 
uh, chiropractic economics, the, the foundation and the colleges, which is the whole recommend run one, recruit one. Get out there, doctors, and start recruiting within your own, your own community and really cultivate that legacy. Because it's great for me to cultivate it for you, but I'm not a doctor. I'm a patient. I'm out recruiting people for the military, okay? <laughs> That's what I know. But I'm not going to recruit people that don't belong there, but I'm going to talk about that. And if I find the person that the chemistry is right and that's what they want, I'm going to want them to go in the military. You know what the right chemistry is. Are you talking about that in the practice? When somebody gets really excited about how they feel better, how their health is better because of you in their life, are you saying, well, gosh, if you're that excited about it, you want to learn more, you might want to consider going to chiropractic college. There isn't a, a child that I meet that I don't ask them, what do you want to do when you grow up? And there's a few adults that are still child children that I ask that too. But I really love going to the colleges and find so many people that chiropractic is a second profession. We all know the military's taking huge cuts and they're getting downsized. How many of them are going to go into chiropractic? The more you do with inserting yourself and helping our military, the wounded and the veterans and whatever, the more your message is going to get brought out and people are going to see that, that might, that's just probably a service that would be so great for our veterans. And you've got a lot of veterans in your college. Tap into that and tell stories, share stories. You all do not share enough. You've got the most incredible stories. I've read all the books just, you know, that tell stories, but you need to tell your story and create the legacy. I hope that you do. Because what they discovered in, in, a, in a survey is that not really very many of you are doing that, at least from the people that took the survey. Okay, now I don't know all the ages of that, but I certainly know that the foundation does. But I want you all to get fire in your belly and get out there and go, gosh, I came into this profession. I believe in this profession. We're healing people. We're making people better. People like me people like Shiloh Harris that you're going to meet. And we need to make sure that it continues. So I hope that you'll consider that. And probably the most important piece of this whole legacy building is relationships. Oh my gosh, the relationships that are in this room. The relationships that are in this room. When I think about all the different people that I have met, I can't even stand up here and list all of them and how, you know, I met this person and then that connects to someone else. And then, you know, I've teased often about a lot of the different services that are provided by the community that supports you, you know, and, uh, and, and, and how I benefit from that. But relationships are so important. How, do you, how are you leveraging those? Do you really think success is a team sport? I hope you do. I hope you do. I know that chiropractic care can complement the care that's already in the VA, that's already in the military. We could argue that it could replace some of it, but it definitely can complement it. I know that. Sergeant Shiloh Harris is going to come out in a few minutes, and he knows that. There's many of us that know that we're just representatives of the greater. What are your relationships? How are you leveraging them? How are you using them for good? Do you have a relationship with the foundation? Do you want to? You should. Free materials help you with your practice. I got to tell you, I run my own business now. There isn't anybody that's offered me free services. Right? It's very unusual. Very unusual. Put this last slide up there about relationships. Because it, at some point, I hope that you can stop and reflect and think about the relationships in your life and the influence that they have had on you. And once again, when good happens to you, do you not want to share it? Do you not want to share it? I know I do. And that's why I love the opportunity that the foundation provides me in being able to engage with you on how you are making a difference. And I really do hope you'll just turn that flame up and burn each other. Send each other, you're so hot. We say the chiropractic community is hot. Nobody's ever said that about me either. 
turn it up. Here's what I'd like to do next. I'd like to transition to, a, and, and don't start that video, because I, you know, I want to, so if I say transition to a short video, they'll start playing it. I got a few words I want to say first. I don't recall when I, uh, I think the first time I met Shiloh Harris might have been in Florida. I'd heard about him, had heard his story. We have a lot of different little things in common. In the military, we're willing to give our lives for each other. More importantly, though, we're willing to live for each other. Every soldier I served with, I consider them like a brother or sister. When I hug them, I say, love you like a brother, love you like a sister. Because we are a family. In fact, we, put, we capitalize family with, we take the word family and capitalize it with a capital F. Sergeant Shiloh Harris would never in a million years call himself a hero. In a million years, he will not call himself a hero. Well, I'm telling you what, you are about to see an American hero. Remember earlier when I said leadership is about the lead, not about the general, it's about our soldiers? I cannot tell you how much I believe that. I would go to visit wounded soldiers, and they would try to get up. They try to salute you, and then they try to get up out of their bed, you know. And they're, and they, I mean, they, they're burned, and they are wounded, and they sometimes have lost a leg or an arm, you know. But they're doing everything because out of the respect for you, they want to do that. You know, be like, hey, dude, just no, this is just stay. You know, lay down, lay down, don't do that, you know. But it's just out of respect, and then, and then they want to get right back with their team, right back with their team because they want to help their team, they want to support their team. How many of you have that sort of passion inside of you? I know you do. I know many of you do. Stir it up in each other, though. Get back to your team. Get back to your practice. How can you serve the greater community? Well, Shiloh Harris, that I consider a brother, a comrade in arms, an awesome man. He has a book called Steel Will. I don't think he can talk about it, but I don't think anybody's going to yell at me for talking about it. I gave it to my whole family for Christmas. Because I read it, I could not put it down. He talks about love, and he talks about loss, and he talks about being loved again. He talks about living. He talks about wanting to die and then living again. He and I lost some of our soldiers on the battlefield, our friends. But what we both know is that if we don't live our lives and share these stories and keep our flame going, then the enemy got a second vote. And so that's why we are willing to tell our stories, be on stage, share them with you, and hope touch your lives in a way that's never been touched before. And I think that's what you're going to see with Sergeant Shiloh Harris.